you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Foss here from thechrisvossshow.com. The Chris Foss Show. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. We are, of course, the Chris Foss Show. The family loves you, but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother or mother in law. Now, go clean your room. No, I'm just kidding, folks. Anyway, guys, go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Foss, youtube.com for chess Chris Foss. Uh, what else is there? There's a, the big LinkedIn group, 130,000 people, LinkedIn.com newsletter. That's very popular over there you can go check that out there's one for myself and for the chris Voss show uh and so that should be pretty cool uh we have an amazing historical author on the show this is his first book that he's put out and, and it's going to educate us on a lot of different things I, I love history uh you know the one thing man can learn from his history as i always say is man uh <laughs> I set that up with a little bit of a sidewind there. The one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history, and thereby we just go round and round and make all the same mistakes. So uh, the great historians, journalists, and authors that uh, come on the show, they help educate us so that we learn stuff so that we'll be smarter, brillianter, and uh, more sexy in the eyes of others, uh, but also to uh, learn stuff so we don't make the same mistakes again, and maybe we can create a better future. So that's important. We have Nick. Tabor, Tabor on the show. Uh, and uh, Nick Tabor is on the show with us today. He is the author of Africa Town, uh, America's Last Slave Ship and the Community It Created. Welcome to the show, Nick. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me. There you go. And Nick, you're a freelance journalist whose work has appeared in New York Magazine, the New York, the New Republic, the Washington Post, and the Paris Review and elsewhere. You live in New York and it's your first book. Uh, welcome to the show. Congratulations on the new book. Give us a dot com where people can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, it's just my name, Nick Tabor.com. There you go. Uh, and uh, Nick, uh, what motivated you want to write this book? Well, uh, this book originated when I was uh, on staff at New York Magazine in 2018, there was this book coming out called Barracoon, uh, written by Zora Neale Hurston. She wrote it in the 1920s, but it wasn't published for, for 90 years. And it consists of her interviews with Kudjo Lewis, who was the last, uh, one of the last survivors uh, still living from the last slave ship that ever came to the U.S. Wow. Uh, she interviewed him when he was uh, like in his 80s. and so it's this amazing historical document that just kind of sat in the vault for for decades so when it was being published uh my editor called me in and said hey we're going to be publishing an excerpt of this this book in the magazine it'd be really great if we could also have a story about what became of the descendants of this guy coach lewis mm -hmm. um and so she said see if you can find him <laughs> you know it's like it's a it might not be easy, but but uh, I think you can do it. So it, it took a couple of weeks to track them down. They had not really made themselves known. Um, but eventually I did reach one of them, a guy named Gary Lumbers, who uh, was living in Philadelphia. And the first time I got Gary on the phone, I remember I was at this, this hotel room in West Texas working on another story. And he said pretty forcefully, you don't need to be writing about the descendants. You need to be writing about the neighborhood. Wow. Um, Cause these, the survivors of the slave ship created a community um, after the civil war, after they were freed called African town. Mm -hmm. uh, the name has now been, been shortened to one word, Africa town. Okay. Um, when he was growing, it's still around. Um, when he was growing up there, he said it was, um, it was this thriving community. There, there were lots of jobs. There were lots of big families. Um, it was like an like a an idyllic experience for him as a child. He said, "Now, if you go there, it looks like a war zone. They they built a highway that through the center of the community that wiped out the the main business district. Wow. They he said that the whole area is surrounded by heavy industry. 
there's so much pollution that people think there's a cancer epidemic. And so it was obviously, and the pop, population was like a fraction of what it had been when he was a kid. So he was saying, this is not just um, like a, another story of like deindustrialization, like Flint or something where a factory leaves. It, it was like this neighborhood was actively destroyed and he wanted to know how that happened. He said, that's what you should be writing about. And I ended up visiting and um, I met, I happened to be there on a day when this law firm was interviewing people about cancer cases. They were getting ready to sue one of the paper mills that had long been in Africa town, um, getting ready to sue them for all the pollution uh, on the basis that they had caused, caused all these cancer cases. So I interviewed a whole bunch of people uh, at this church who each could just rattle off a list of people from their families who had died from cancer often at, at young ages and um, and a lot of people who had survived it themselves, and um, and the pastor told me that it had been there, been that way ever since he he came to the neighborhood. It really seemed like more than just your standard, you know, standard amount of, of cancer in a community. So um, it left me, it left a stark impression on me. I, I kept thinking, you know, what is the link between the slave ship and the pollution? Uh, like how did this neighborhood get get sort of singled out to bear so much of the industrial pollution of Southern Alabama? Like of all the places they could have put it, put those factories, why did they choose the neighborhood that was established by the survivors of the last slave ship? Oh, and, wow. and um, so um, I wanted to piece it together. So you know, I, I, yeah, I kept thinking, I wish I could just move down there and devote myself to that full time and really piece together all of those links decade by decade. And then it occurred to me one day on my walk home from the subway that I probably could do that, um, that a publisher would be interested. And so at the end of 2019, with a book contract in hand, I, I moved down to Alabama uh, to investigate um, that question. Wow. There you go. Now, in moving down there, I mean, are you a little concerned? Are you, are you moved to Africa town specifically? And you know, I mean, with the pollution and cancer rates and stuff, or do you move someplace close by? I moved to a place close by. Um, okay. There's not a lot of rental property, you know, within Africa Town anyway, mm -hmm. and it's quite a, it's quite an intimate community, and it would have, um, it it wouldn't have felt appropriate for me to to move right into the center of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I was there often. Uh, I was I was, you know, really a pretty short bike ride away. Uh, living in within Mobile, and for the first few months before the COVID lockdowns began, I was there just about every day. Anytime there was a meeting in the community or some kind of event, I was there. If there was a cleanup day, you know, I was there with a rake <laughs> or a shovel, like not just not just reporting, but volunteering. Um, so I, I immersed myself in the place as much as I could. There you go. And so the 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 book is a story that's not only about uh, the original, this, this slave ship, the last slave ship, uh, it's about this community and then also, uh, what's kind of billed as environmental racism. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, the slave, the story of the slave ship itself, um, is pretty riveting. I should say, um, it's worth giving some background on that. I think the, um, so it, the voyage, uh, began in the spring of 1860, Mobile was one of the largest port cities in the United States. It was it was third, in fact, right after uh, New York and New Orleans. So much cotton being moved in and out of Africa Town or of, of Mobile, and so there was this shortage of of enslaved people, of enslaved workers. It was not legal to import them from West Africa anymore. They had long since. Um, Banned this country had long since banned the, the transatlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. but uh, this business magnate named Timothy Mayer, who owned a lumber mill and a shipyard and some other some other businesses, um, he the the lore is that he told his friends um, he said, well, you know, the federal government says they're going to crack down on these illegal voyages, but I don't I don't believe it, um, and I'll put my money where my mouth is and I will send a ship to West Africa and bring over, um, you know, a hundred slaves. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to show, I'm going to prove that the federal government 
isn't serious and that, you know, you can still get away with this. And it seems as if he meant this as a, an act of political protest. Wow. He was, he was like, he and, 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 a, and quite a few other Southern businessmen were, were pushing to have the slave trade reopened. And so this was, um, it seems like this was part of that campaign. He was, um, as I say, he was kind of putting his money where his mouth was. So he sent this ship over. It arrived in um, the port of Ouida in the Gulf of Guinea that spring. Mm-hmm. Um, he carried over uh, about 110 men, women, and children across the Middle Passage. The journey took about six or seven weeks and was you know, just a, a, a truly horrific um, experience for the people on board. Um, they, uh, the ship sneaked into Mobile Bay. Uh, the captain transferred all the people to another, another ship and then, and hid them in like a swamp for, for weeks and burned the ship down to the waterline to destroy the evidence, um, to make sure that, that it would be impossible to prosecute them. And Everybody in Mobile knew about this. Uh, it was reported in the, the newspaper immediately and then went global. Um, I found dozens, like scores of newspapers um, mm-hmm. where it was reported that week, um, mm-hmm. mostly in the U.S., but also in Europe. And I've always suspected that that um, the guy who was behind it all actually tipped the newspaper off. We don't know, but that's 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 sort of my guess. Wow. Educa- educated guess. So, so, he, um, so he got away with it. Uh, the the prosecutors, you know, the local federal prosecutor, knew about it, but but didn't didn't prosecute anyone. Uh, the the civil war started nine months after the voyage, and after that, nobody nobody wanted to prosecute. Um, you know, somebody for nobody in the South was going to prosecute someone for bringing slaves over. So five years later, these people were emancipated, and they had no way of getting back to West Africa. They wanted to go. Uh, back home, but they couldn't. So they created this. So a few dozen of them out of more, more than a hundred created this community where they could speak Yoruba and, uh, and other West African languages and uh, choose their own leaders and, um, and sort of be left alone and govern themselves. They bought property, they built houses uh, and this place became yeah, became known as African Town. There's, there's really nothing else like it um, in the United States. A community that was created by people who had been um, brought through the Middle Pass by w- West Africans who had themselves survived the Middle Passage. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so because it's such a dramatic history, I thought, um, I thought this was the perfect, the perfect story um, to talk about environmental racism. So mm-hmm. this is a this is a widespread problem. It's a it's a common thing for communities of color to um to be like heavily overburdened with pollution or in some cases just to have really bad infrastructure to be underdeveloped. You know, there are cases in in states like Alabama where where communities of color just don't have like functioning sewers and plumbing. Um, mm-hmm. But more often it takes the form of, of like factory pollution or here in New York where I am, we have um, like, we have this section in the Bronx that we call asthma alley, the cross Bronx expressway wow. this big highway runs through it. And there's so much exhaust um, from the cars uh, that, that kids who grow up there very often suffer from asthma. And um, in, a, in, in, so many of these cases the racial composition of the neighborhood is directly linked to the like the development patterns and the ways that that factories got cited there or highways got built there um and so so the point of this book was to figure out how it happened in this one community um but also like through that lens to get a better sense of how it happens everywhere and why, why places like the South Bronx exist too. I really could say that by extension, it's a way of trying to understand better, you know, how race still, um, <laughs> how it still plays a role in, in the way our cities are shaped and, um, and distribution of power and, and, um, and who controls what resources. 
Yeah. Uh, we had Ed Glad Jr. on the uh, show, and we talked about uh, how, you know, communities are built, freeways are built. You know, we were built to separate um, separate us from each other, uh, white and black communities, and, and sadly create, uh, you know, blighted areas that uh, didn't have a lot of jobs and other opportunities. And, and it, it kind of, it, you know, you end up with different issues. And I'm sure pollution is, a, is another factor. But this is a pretty unique story. Um, you know, and, and he'd written a book on um, Baldwin, James yeah, Baldwin. Begin Again, yeah. Yeah, Begin Again. And and the interesting thing about James Baldwin is you can take and lift all of his quotes and, and all of his writings from the 60s and 50s and literally just transpose them to today, and they still work, sadly. Um, so this is really interesting, and it, it's extraordinary. It's the last slave ship because it had been outlawed. They, they came in, they cover it up. They, these folks build a community because they miss their homeland and they want to speak their language. And then, so what happens after this? Does, does basically robber barons or people of industry, white people of industry, take advantage of them uh, by coming in with pollutive, pollution generating uh, things? And then, you know, you've got Jim Crow laws that come in and different things like that. How, how does it evolve from there to where now it's become incredibly polluted and they have cancer issues? Kind of like, yeah. it, it kind of almost seems like a, who's that one gal? Brockovich, Aaron Bar Brockovich yeah, movie Brockovich. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it is quite similar. Yeah. I, um, I was able to find answers in the course of my, you know, couple of years of research. I always think that you have to go back to reconstruction uh, right after the civil war to understand uh, the the broader story. So right after the war, it was unclear what what the North, what the federal government was going to do for for the black people in the South who had just been set free. And one of my favorite Americans uh, is Thaddeus Stevens, who was one of the radical Republican legislators, uh, who he, he so he gave a speech in 1865 right after the war in pennsylvania where he said if we're really serious about reforming this country and reforming the south what we need to do is seize seize the plantations <laughs> like take the land from those southern aristocrats um break break those plantations up and give the land to the black people and he said we'll accomplish two things that way we'll create this broad class of of black entrepreneurs you know yeoman farmers at the same time, we'll also break up the planter class and and shatter their their power and their hold on southern politics and the economy for good. Um, and um, it, it obviously did not happen. Um, like the 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 Confederates, you know, the Confederate traders did not have their their land taken away from them. And so, people, I bring it. Part of the reason I bring it up. Is that people like Timothy Mayer, the guy who chartered this this slave voyage, mm -hmm. would have been exactly the kind of person uh, who would have been targeted by a policy like that. He mm -hmm. owned all of this land and had all of this wealth. And if a proposal like Thaddeus Stevens' idea had gone through, then that wealth, that that land and that wealth would have been redistributed to um, you know probably did some of the people that he that he brought over on the Clotilda. Um, instead, uh, he held on to it. He passed it on to his kids. In uh, around the turn of the century, um, all these Jim Crow laws were passed. And it's not just, I think it's important to understand that the Jim Crow laws were not just segregation laws. They were also, um, like all of the Southern governments, um, starting with Mississippi, created new laws or in some cases rewrote their constitutions to systematically strip black people of their voting rights. Wow. Um, so they just had no uh, political power anymore. They had no way of, um, of, of standing up for their rights. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's sort of a deadly combination of no, it, it, for them it turned out to be deadly, no, no wealth, no land um, forced to, continue working for pitiful wages for the people who used to keep them enslaved. Um, at the same time, Northern industry started, started making um, incursions on the South. Uh, it was like the first version of offshoring jobs to, you know, other countries. They, 
these northern companies founded in the south, there were no unions, and the southern governments were so happy to have them, they would just let them do anything. Let wow. them let them tear apart the forests, let them pollute the rivers, um, and uh, and let them treat the workers poorly. And so the the people who benefited from that were the were the wealthy people in the south, like the mayor family, who already had this land. Mm-hmm. We see how this plays out in Africa Town in the 1920s. Uh, this the largest paper company in in the, in New England. Uh, approached the Chamber of Commerce in Mobile and said, we want to build a paper factory somewhere in your county. Um, Can you hook us up? And it it looks as if the way this happened is the Chamber of Commerce said, yeah, you should, you know, like, let us introduce you to the the mayor family, the the grand or the son of the guy who brought the slaves over. Like he has lots of land uh, that nobody's using. And so, um, the company ended up, um, I think, originally leasing and maybe later buying, excuse me, some property from from the Mayer family. Um, built this enormous paper factory uh, at the at the border of Africa Town. People didn't know as much about environmental health back then, but they knew that paper factories smelled terrible, wow. and of course they didn't want it downtown. Um, but um, the people living in Africa town didn't have any, any say over whether they wanted it in their backyard or not. And, um, so after that one was built, um, the, the area became increasingly industrialized and, um, more and more factories were added on. And a lot of that land actually was, was built on, or excuse me, a lot of that, a lot of those factories were built on land that belonged to the family of, of the guy who brought the people over. Wow. It's just extraordinary. It's, you, get, you have multi-generational environmental racism, basically. They got hand, handed down through generations and land and ownership and stuff. Uh, I was reading here from equaljusticeinitiative.org, uh, uh, paper, asphalt, petrochemical plants, pipelines, and coal terminals surrounded the town. Uh, this is from an article from 2018, and they talked about how activists successfully defeated an oil storage tank farm proposal in 2015. But last year, this would have been 2017, Mobile adopt Mobile uh, Mobile, Mobile, Mobile. Alabama, mm-hmm. adopted a uh, future land use plan that leaves Africa Town's small residential area unprotected from the continued threat of further industrialization. So you know, even as as recently as a few years ago. This uh, sort of issue is going on. I was also reading the Guardian that uh, from that same time in 2018, Senator Cory Booker and and uh, EPA environmental justice lead um, uh, was was looking into it. Has anything come of this? Is have they are they still have they still lost their rights? Has there been anything that the, the attorneys are are helping achieve or or any politicians or politics or the EPA? There have been some developments. Um, I mean, first I should say that. Um, the wreckage of the, of the ship itself, the Clotilda was identified in the Mobile Delta in 2000. It was 2019 when they announced it, it took, Mm -hmm. it took like a year's worth of research before they felt confident that the ship that they had singled out was, was the right one. And that was a, um, an extraordinary piece of news. I mean, it's, um, very few slave wrecks have ever been found off of off of the american coastlines and this one is like probably the most intact of any of any slave ship we've ever um we've ever identified wow so that's a big deal the people in africa town are trying to they they think feel like their best hope for um protecting the community and and um and restoring the housing and bringing some jobs they think their best hope is to uh, is to make it sort of a heritage tourism destination. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned EJI equal justice initiative. They have this lynching memorial in Montgomery oh, yeah. and, and it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty unsettling experience, um, to go to that memorial mm-hmm. and the museum that's connected. But, um, it's, I mean, it's a profound experience. I have to say it's something you never forget. And, uh, within a year of it opening, it had brought, um, 
it had brought thousands, I think maybe hundreds of thousands of visitors from all over the world and, and, and had generated something like $1 billion in, in economic activity for mm -hmm. the city of Montgomery. And so we feel like people in the community feel like there is an appetite for that kind of experience that, that helps you, um, I guess, sort of get, it help encourages you to reflect on, on some of the, the most horrific episodes from American history. Um, of course, it's also, in this case, it's also a story of, of heroism, I think, and endurance. Um, at any rate, that's what they have in mind. The discovery of the ship is a big, a big asset um, in that endeavor. The other thing that's happened is there was a documentary that aired on, on Netflix. It, it's still on, but it, it debuted in the fall. Uh, it was backed by the Obama's production company. Uh, some of your viewers and listeners might have seen it. It's called Descendant, oh. and and um, it's a it's a marvelous documentary. It it uh, just a, I think a brilliant piece of filmmaking. I was involved <laughs> in making it, but I I'm not taking any credit here. It's because of mm. other I mean, my role was pretty small, and it's because of um, of the work of many others on the team, um, especially the director Margaret Brown. That it was so good. Uh, that has brought a huge amount of attention to this neighborhood. And on the strength of that documentary, um, a coalition from Africatown recently went, recently visited the White House um, and spoke with members of the, of the Biden administration. Mm. Um, there's uh, quite a lot more money coming in to the community now. There is, uh, so there's a lot of support from outside. Mm -hmm. the, the city of Mobile, um, like I, it's my per, my perception is that the city of Mobile can't decide whether it wants to be more like Charleston, South Carolina, and emphasize its beautiful what could be a beautiful waterfront. Unfortunately, uh -huh. the waterfront is all occupied by heavy industry, and you can't really get to the water in Mobile. But uh -huh. that that's that's one version of Mobile that we could have. Uh, it still has some beautiful architecture downtown. It has great seafood. Um, whether they want to make it a tourist destination like that or whether they want to stake everything on the petroleum industry like Houston. And um, and you can't have both. <laughs> you know, those yeah. are two two very different kinds of cities. And um, so, but they, they they like to think that they can have both. So they, they tend to give lip service to these efforts to make Africa town a uh, heritage tourism destination. But in practice, um, they're not really giving a lot of meaningful support. Um, there is, however, a, um, a museum opening uh, in July there. Uh, that'll be the first piece of like real infrastructure that the community has for, for receiving visitors. Um, and so we're, we're all looking forward to that. It'll be a, a good development. Awesome sauce. You know, the, the, what do you feel? What do you hope people come away with reading the book and learning about this uh, important piece of history that uh, shaped us? You know, I've sometimes thought that. Um, so I, I guess it depends on who the reader is. I sometimes thought when I was working on this that I wanted to. I thought about what I was like when I was a teenager. This, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a pretty conservative teenager actually growing up in in the Midwest, and I felt like. Maybe, maybe there was a time when affirmative action made sense, but, you know, but at that point it certainly did not, you know, I thought it was just whatever reverse racism. I didn't, I, I just didn't really, believe, I felt like the, the African Americans I knew were um, pretty much treated fairly by teachers, by our bosses at work. And I felt like racism just wasn't really a, a serious force in America anymore. And I, when I was working on this book, I felt like, obviously, I mean, that's obviously not my perception, my perspective now. There were times when I was working on this book when I felt like I want to write a book that would have persuaded me when I was a teenager um, that race still was really a powerful um, factor in, in shaping people's lives in America. Now, maybe a lot of your readers don't need to be persuaded of that. <laughs> maybe they already know. Um, but, but I also think that, um, I, I, th I think this book makes it, makes it clear and explicit in a way that, that not many stories really could because the links are so direct and so strong in this case. I also think that, um, 
there's just not nearly enough awareness of of environmental racism and there's not enough literature about it and as i say because this story is so dramatic because it's this riveting story about about the last slave ship and it and the survivors um I, in a way i felt like i was baiting the hook like like i could get people to read about environmental racism in this case because it's such a rich dramatic narrative um so i think people should read it because it's I mean, I, th I think they'll find it gripping. Um, the story itself is j just is a gripping one, uh, but I think that it also fills a void of of um, literature on on environmental racism. And I hope readers will will um, read it and and learn more about that. Definitely, and we can't change the future unless we understand the past, the mistakes we made. We can't correct them, and what goes on, and then and then uh, you know it, it's. It, it, it's sad a lot of the stuff that's happened in the course of our history, but we need to look at it and go, Hey man, we can do better. We should do better. We, we hope should. we should want to do better. There's one, one other thought I've had about solutions about like what this, what does this mean? How does this cash out in terms of how we can change the future or, you know, or change the present? How can we change? What does this tell us about how we can affect change in the world? And you mentioned those take far, tank farms in Africa town. They wanted to, there was a proposal to build these, this, all these petroleum tanks that are like, each one is like the size of a house. They're huge. Wow. Uh, there are already some tank farms like that near the neighborhood. But at the same time, there was a proposal to build a pipeline through the main water supply for Southern Alabama, not just Africa town, but everybody. Um, and lots of white people showed up. Um, when they heard about the pipeline going through the water supply people believed that the tank farm in africa town and the pipeline through the the lake were connected and so for the first time all these white people felt like like they started to sort of link arms with people in africa town because mm. they felt like they had a shared interest here they felt like each of them had something at stake like africa town didn't want the tank farms and nobody wanted their water supply to be endangered. And one of my, one of the central people in the book told me, I mean, Mobile was a pretty segregated city politically, especially. He said that when, when these protesters went down to city hall, black people and white people together, linking arms um, to, to say, we don't want this, that it, it, it was obvious that that people in the city council were surprised they'd never seen that before they'd never seen that kind of thing in mobile he said you could see it in their eyes and so and, and ultimately they were successful in blocking those tank farms from being built and I, I think the takeaway is that what you have to do is try to create a, a like a, an interracial coalition that's not just based on white people's um pangs of conscience not just based on them wanting to do the right thing but to really like obtain a majority, you know, to get the kind of critical mass you need in a majoritarian democracy, it has to be based on people's shared material interests. Um, that's what, you know, drives, I mean, a lot of the time anyway, sometimes it's culture wars, but a lot of the time that's what drives people to the polls. Um, it's, it's things like healthcare. It's things like, um, it's things like, they're like schools. Um, uh, it's, it's their, it's their, their their paychecks and their health and the health of their children so um i think that uh that's something we can learn from this story there you go i love what you, I love what you said there it's a great little uh, uh vignette um you know the the common good of everyone um you know pe uh, unfortunately we live in a world where politics is used against us uh, by politicians of course we chose them so you get the politicians you you vote for but um we live in this world of, of scarcity where we're you know we're told oh you know if we help somebody else uh, it takes away from us and really when you study america in its early years you know the rising tide lifts all boats i mean that's the beauty of america you know it's the melting pot of the ideas and people and cultures and and races and people from all walks of life that have made America great and have contributed in so many different ways. And uh, so, you know, we need to, books like this help us understand that, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. We need to help everybody because when everybody wins, we all win. And yeah. when, when we live in this scarcity mindset, we're just 
sitting and fighting, clawing over scraps. And, and meanwhile, yeah. billionaires are wandering off laughing or something. And you're just right. like, yeah, that's you know. the thing. I think you have to identify the actual malefactors, whether it was, you know, the railroad companies in, in the 1800s or, um, you know, or the oil companies and, and, you know, maybe the tech companies and the banks today. Um, like it's not, it's not the, it's not the people who have no power, like, you know, undocumented immigrants <laughs> who are, who are making your life worse. It's, 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 it's the people who control all the resources. So, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, uh, it, wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, give us your .com so people can have you on the, uh, check you out on the interweb and get to know you better. For sure. Uh, it's Nick Tabor.com T A B O R. There you go. Uh, thanks, Nick, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, so youtube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, and all the other crazy place we are on the interwebs, the LinkedIn, etc. cetera. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. All right.